everyone. Welcome back to the Healthy Peace Hill podcast. I am so glad you are joining me this week as I continue my series on Ayurveda, an ancient system of wellness from India that truly is meaningful and practical to our modern lives. As you know, the state of well-being in the U.S. is currently not optimal. Much of our healthcare paradigm is based on a we won't fix it until it's broken model, with little emphasis placed on how stress, and the accelerated pace of our lives impact our health. Ayurveda is a paradigm which asks us to step up, to consider how every aspect of our lives influences our health. Instead of focusing on disease, Ayurveda attunes us to the subtle imbalances that percolate in our mind and physiology. When we are so attuned, we gain the capacity to align and realign. We become powerful instead of powerless we gain the opportunity for perfect health. Every week I explore these principles with a fascinating guest who is on the path, or I share what is resonating with me. Thank you for supporting this podcast and being a co-creator in conceiving of and participating in the new paradigm, the healthy, peaceful world. Today, I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Robert Keith Wallace, PhD in physiology from UCLA, a pioneer in bridging ancient Ayurvedic wisdom with modern science to unlock the secrets of longevity and vibrant living. Dr. Wallace is a renowned scientist, author, and educator who has dedicated his career to exploring the intersection of mind, body, and consciousness. He is perhaps best known for his groundbreaking research on the physiology of consciousness, and his work in bringing Ayurvedic principles into mainstream understanding. With a PhD in physiology from the University of California, Dr. Wallace's journey into the realm of holistic health began early in his career. He was drawn to the ancient wisdom of Ayurveda, recognizing its profound insights into human health and longevity. In his book that we will be discussing today, 16 Super Biohacks for Longevity, Dr. Wallace delves into practical strategies inspired by Ayurveda to promote longevity and well being in the modern world. He emphasizes how these time tested practices align with recent discoveries in modern medical science, such as the microbiome, highlighting their relevance and enhancing both lifespan and quality of life. Throughout his career, Dr. Wallace has been a tireless advocate for integrating ancient wisdom with contemporary scientific understanding. He has conducted extensive research on meditation, stress reduction, and holistic approaches to health, shedding light on the profound impact of mind-body practices on overall, overall wellness. Dr. Wallace's work not only provides valuable insights into extending lifespan, but also emphasizes the importance of living creatively and productively at every stage of life, a principle deeply rooted in Ayurvedic tradition. Join us as we delve into the wisdom of the ages and explore practical strategies for achieving optimum health and vitality with Dr. Robert Keith Wallace. Welcome, Keith. Hi, nice to see you. Great. Awesome. So, yeah, let me just switch my page and my iPad here and we'll get started. Um, yeah, so. I want to start out, we're talking about your book, Keith, the, the 16 biohacks for longevity. Um, I really want to talk out, start out with the word biohack and what that word means to you. Yeah, I like to um, have some contemporary at, foot in the door. And so biohack is that kind of new word that's used for anything that improves your health and longevity. And um, it includes ancient techniques, modern techniques. Um, and, you know, there's a, quite a bit written about it out there. Everybody's interested, but it's something which changes your physiology. Could be food, could be meditation, could be exercise, could be a cold bath, could be anything that changes your physiology. 
And in this case, we're looking at what are those ancient and modern techniques which can best help you live a healthy and long life? Awesome, that's great, that's wonderful. I know in your book, you talked about um, essentially the, the alarming rise in dementia, uh, not only Alzheimer's, but other types of dementia. You said in your book that one in three seniors have Alzheimer's or another form of dementia. What do you attribute this to? Well, you know, if you have to look at it, it's everything. It's, you know, the number one risk factor for cardiovascular disease, for example, is lack of exercise. Diet is hugely important for diabetes and people consider um, Alzheimer's as uh, diabetes three, as opposed to diabetes one and two. Um, stress, meditation, huge for Alzheimer's. There's just so many factors, supplements. Um, so in the end, it's the accumulation of all those habits that you have in your life. You may go to a doctor and the doctor tells you, oh, you should exercise more, you should eat better, but people don't do it. They rely on medicine. And the problem is there's no medicine for Alzheimer's. So they can take medicine for blood pressure, which has relatively few side effects and can help them. But Alzheimer's right now is without any really effective medicine. And these medicines only just focus on the symptoms. If you were to see what's going on inside the brain, you'd have to say inflammation was the biggest cause. And it's precipitated by everything from high bl blood glucose levels to all the other aspects that are, you know, the microbiome. Um, some people talk about the blood brain barrier getting uh, compromised, this, this shield that the brain has, and that uh, things can get in. And then a lot of the plaques that people were trying to figure out what, you know, these plaques form, they're kind of conglomerations that gum up the works. And people thought, oh, well, that's just, um, you know, that's the cause, we'll eliminate those. But it turns out they might be another symptom that, you know, when the microbiome gets upset, these gut bacteria, then um, something happens to the blood brain barrier, things creep in and the brain's own immune system starts attacking. And the result of that attack are these plaques. So it's sure, it ends sure. up being a you know a mess, and it's all yeah so many factors. It's hard to pinpoint right. one. Right. So some of these things that we'll be talking about and that you've addressed in your book yeah. could be helpful for um, continuing to have vital cognitive health as as we age. Would would that be a correct statement? Yeah. There's you know health span and lifespan it's not so great to have a long lifespan and not have a good health span. So right. people need, and it's all prevention. I mean, you know, taking drugs is not a good solution at this point. Um, so ultimately it, the younger you can start forming good, healthy habits, uh, that makes all the difference in the world and compliance with those habits is the key to everything. And in this book, we're going to we talk give, about that. Okay. We're going to talk we're going to talk about compliance. So that's really a key thing. Yeah. But I know one of the things you mentioned was that the, you know, we have a lot of this these modern biohacks. Um and it's sort of a term of art. And but many of them are expensive. And then you talk about some of the ancient biohacks. Yeah. Just, you know, and, and in the introduction of your book, you talk about Ayurveda and Tia. Um yeah. and you also talk about that there may be, there's a possibility with looking at some of these ancient biohacks, it's important to think about your particular body type, your personality, how you interact with the world. Yeah. I mean, one of the ones I like that there was this wonderful Ayurvedic physician who was a super expert on pulse, Dr. Triguna. And I traveled around the world with him, you know, to different countries, meeting prime ministers, health ministers, China, Egypt, all over the world, National Institutes of Health. He took the pulse of one of the directors there and, and told him he had just passed a kidney stone. The guy was so shocked that he couldn't even believe how he could know that. 
And the Dr. Tiguna, one of the simplest things he recommended was walking at sunrise, um, getting that early morning sunlight. And you know, when I first heard it, I thought, well, that's very sweet, something that people probably did in the ancient times. And you know, not so practical if you live in Iowa and it's freezing in the morning and winter. But um, you know, I kind of didn't pay much attention to it. And then I started listening to different podcasts and different things. And I realized, oh my God, this turns out to be incredibly important. There's a scientific basis to it. That light coming in, you know, it's a different freak. It has a different quality to it than other light. It's more red and yellow. And we know red light therapy now is a big rage because there's huge research showing how it affects the DNA. But just that early morning sunlight, what it does in the simplest form is it goes you know through the eyes gets up to um through a series of nerve passageways that it sends signals to this superchiasmatic nuclei in the hypothalamus this tiny little center in the brain and there you have the master clock and that master clock literally synchronizes all the other clocks in the body and there's literally i mean there is a clock in every cell in the dna so that's a lot of clocks to synchronize. And we know that when people get out of sync with nature, like shift workers, much higher prevalence of cardiovascular, all kinds of disease. So that is important. And simply this light coming in to this suprachiasmatic nuclei, then it goes to the pineal gland and shuts down melatonin, which is called the sleep hormone. Now that makes it easier for you to go to sleep at night because now that hormone is set on the rhythms of nature. So that's one thing. And then there's a whole other theory that that light goes through the skull. It goes, uh, you know, right into the cells and that light um, affects the mitochondria, these little power plants in every cell of the body. And there it produces also melatonin, but this melatonin has a totally different function. It's a antioxidant, very powerful if we want to live longer. So here's just one simple thing. I don't know if you ever heard Andrew Huberman. He's a wonderful. Oh, oh yeah. I, I, and actually, uh, that's I'm so glad you. I, I think that's one of his top biohacks. Yeah, he loves sunlight. That, that you know, is, that's in the morning, the morning sunlight. Yeah, and he doesn't. Um, so. You don't have to get up at sunrise for him, but just getting up when the sun is out in the morning. Sure he considers yeah. critical. Right. Well, that's interesting because in your book, um, the, the you really have just touched upon really three of the biohacks. One is uh, the morning light. Yeah. Uh, and, this, and the morning walk, morning right. light, morning walk. Um, the second one is exercise. Right. And then the third one is this, is the daily routine, which is essentially they're all interrelated. The circadian rhythms. Yeah, you're right. Um, so maybe we can just go right into circadian rhythms and why Ayurveda emphasizes the daily routine. You know, lots of people think, well, this is just a rigid approach to life. But could you speak more clearly on that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, circadian rhythm is something that we keep finding more and more about a nobel prize was given for understanding the genetic mechanisms of it and over and over you know we see scientific studies that are showing that when you're out of sync with nature then you have this increase in disease as i mentioned before so there's a realization now that um, circadian rhythms are essential for good health and um, they involve light they involve you know many aspects of the environment so people in our you know modern civilization people stay up late late with artificial light their sleep habits are all mixed up and they end up you know messing up these clocks and these clocks have a lot to do with our health and Ayurveda, you know, thousands of years ago, laid out this ridiculously common sense, simple, simple principle. You know, go to bed early, you know, like before 10, and get up in the morning early, take this walk, meditate, 
you know, do a whole series of things. And it's done in a form of habits and you don't have to think about it. And each of these things contributes to the prevention of disease. And so this series of, you know, steps in the daily rhythm, and they also have seasonal rhythms, that has a very, very positive effect as we now find out from modern science. Each of these things, in, in, in fact, are important factors in longevity because longevity is not one thing, it's everything. So daily rhythm from the Ayurvedic standpoint is, again, free, simplest thing you can do, and yet having a big impact on every aspect of your life. And once it becomes a habit, you don't even think about it anymore. You just like brushing your teeth in the morning. You just do it. No problem. Sure. And in Ayurveda, along with the circadian rhythm and the daily routine, they've got we've got these times of day that Ayurveda talks about. Uh, we've got the Vata Pitta Kapha time. And as far our listeners may not know what Vata Pitta Kapha time um, necessarily is, um, in a way, that's not so important. But what is important is you know, what are those times of day and what are the most significant things that people can be doing during those times of day to align with the daily rhythms? Yeah, I mean, the in the morning, you know, getting up exercising, that's a, often a kapha time and it's just good to um, help balance kapha. Uh, the afternoon, you know, noon and, is... And tell me why it's considered kapha time. What are the it's elements the, of kapha? It's in their are... clock. You know, they have, they, they identify certain hours between this hour and that hour, wherever the sun is, as a, as aligned with these three basic elements, the doshas. And so mm -hmm. that knowledge has been there for thousands of years. They know, for example, at noon, it's a very pitta time. Pitta is really good for digestion. So they want the main meal to be during that time when the digestion is the best. And then evening, if you go past- Is that because, is, is that because Pitta really aligns with the nat the element of fire? Yeah. Um, and that, that is the time of day when the sun is the highest. So our Agni or our, just, our digestive fire is the strongest. So we wanna to try to align our, our behaviors and our habits with nature's rhythms. Yeah, they basically see all disease as, you know, at least most disease, um, not necessarily genetic, but all kind of modern diseases stemming from this improper digestion. And there's many factors that contribute to it, but um, the most important is the sort of fire of digestion called Agni, as you said. So they do everything to improve Agni because they've, what, disease for them is kind of interpreted, it's interesting, as the formulation of something called ama. So when digestion, when the fire of digestion isn't good, you don't properly digest the food. This improperly digested food can leak into the system and block shrotas, little channels in the body, and cause havoc everywhere. The best equivalent understanding of that is leaky gut syndrome, which used to be something that only chiropractors talked about, and nobody believed it, but a lot of top physiologists have explained it as maybe the cause of most disease. And it comes, uh, this guy Alessio Fasano at Harvard did all this amazing research showing that, um, you know, certain people like celiacs he studied, they're really easy to study for this, and they have this um, allergy to gluten. And what happens is when the gluten, um, you know, particle, some subparticle of it, hits a receptor on the lining of the stomach, it releases a substance called zonulin. And zonulin has the effect of loosening the, the kind of binding that holds the cells together and protects the inside of the gut from the inside of the body. So when that opens up, when zonulin happens, and it happens for a totally different reason, it's a whole other story. But when it, it, when it opens up, then undigested food and bacteria leak into the bloodstream. Now, 
the gut has about 70% of the immune system. So when you- Now, I, I know you- I know you actually have another book. Um, <laughs> I do on the microbiome, and on it's it's the repair and digest diet. There's yeah, there's two books. One is called Gut yeah. Crisis, which really right. goes into this microbiome deeply, and then the and rest I and I like repair. that book very much. It's very practical. Yeah, and then the a diet to help it. I mean, ultimately, it's you need the gut lining. We've just had bad diets, and yeah, I I, I think. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk about that, and we can certainly do that uh, perhaps in another podcast. But okay. getting, getting back to the daily rhythms and thinking about um, just the beauty of Ayurveda, this ancient wisdom, and, and really uh, resetting our biological clock, aligning with nature's rhythm, rhythms, the right. importance of circadian rhythms. Uh, many people will look at the daily routine as, oh, just another thing to do. Right. Uh, but if we just get in sync, with some basic things, and that's what I want to touch on. Um, we've got the kapha time, which is early morning, which is um, six to ten, and then we've got the pitta time. And kapha, the the elements of kapha are heavy and dense. And then we got pitta time, fire, which is going to be um, ten to two, and then we have vata time, which is two to six, and vata is more movement and energy, creativity. It can also exhibit as anxiety and nervousness, but really the positive and negative qualities. But thinking about the qualities of nature and what we can do in our lives to fully align, what would be the most important thing during Kapha time? You mentioned exercise, um, you know, just getting getting moving right, and, and doing exactly. some things to okay. And um, I know it's also in Ayurveda they talk about really getting up before six because that's when kapha time comes in we want to get try to get up before six try to get up before sunrise could you talk about that a little bit and why that's important yeah i mean i think the some people do it naturally um and some people have a very hard time kapha people interesting enough have a very hard time they take a long time to get up in the morning like if you have a kapha kid um, that, you know, and you're a Pitta parent, you've, you're up early. You can't figure out why your kid is taking so long to wake up. But it is, it's in the nature of the child that it's harder for them. They take longer to wake up. And Kaphas have this kind of inherent steadiness. They're very happy, but they can be a little slow at some times. And so for them, the most important thing is, like you said, activity getting them moving, being creative. So they need help sometimes. So having a mom that can encourage the kapha kid to get up, take a walk, be active, that keeps the kapha in balance. And when the kapha is in balance, then the bad qualities of kapha don't come out. The bad qualities of kapha are often lethargy. They can be all kinds of psychological qualities like stubbornness. It's very hard to get a kapha kid to change a habit you know, to adopt a new habit because they like to be fixed in a certain way. So everything you can do to keep one of these doshas balanced improves all other aspects of life. Right. Yeah. And then the pitta time would really be the 10 to 2. So maybe the most important thing people can do is try to eat their largest meal midday. I mean, yeah, that's a little challenging yeah. in our culture. Yeah, there's hangry, you know, pitta, when it's out of balance, people get angry, irritable. So very typically, people who don't eat their main meal at noon, but skip it, like they're working hard or doing something else, they get irritable and angry, which is, you know, causes a lot of problems. So getting them to do this one simple thing, main meal at noon, can quiet down their emotions enormously. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and so vata time, two to six in the afternoon, if you were, if you had a client and there was one thing that you could suggest that they do during that period of time, what would it be? Um, I mean, meditate, anything that can ground you. Okay. Uh, yoga is good. Anything that vata's problem is it gets out of balance, you get nervous and anxious. When it's in balance, you're highly creative and enthusiastic. So the key to um, Vada 
is being grounded. And so any sort of practice that calms you down, like meditation, um, like yoga, those are just ideal essential oils can be very good. Um, anything that's grounding uh, is very, very valuable. Awesome. That's great. And I know um, in your book, you talk about super habits and you talk about uh, B.J. Fogg, who's the author of Tiny Habits, and that he has this habit called the Maui habit, getting up each morning and saying, it's going to be a great day. Uh, and then we all know about the practice of gratitude and we, people have gratitude journals. Let me ask you a question about that. It's not Ayurvedic. It's more a, my personal curiosity, what your thoughts sure. are. You know, gratitude in some way, it's sort of like the molecules of emotion. You can write things down, but writing things down to me is different than actually feeling it. Right. <laughs> you mean you're talking about mood making. You could mood make gratitude, but not really have gratitude. Yeah. So do you... Do you yeah, I would agree you, with you. I would agree with you. What, I mean... How, what do you think are there some of the best practices well, to cultivate I think, gratitude? Yeah, I think affirmations have a value. Your self-talk is something that's, you know, everybody's interested in. Are you the inner critic? Or are you the inner coach? So you can, and you know, you can't change self-talk that easy. This is something that's going on inside you. It's based on your early childhood, it's based on so many things in your life. So if you mood make too much, like, oh, I'm so gratitude and giving and, you know, get up like that, then it really, it just sort of divides the mind. It's not who you are. It doesn't help. On the other hand, if you can just be, nudge yourself a little in that direction. So you're being a little more positive. You're being a little more of a coach rather than a critic you're being a little more aware that um, there's more than just you in creation. There are higher forces and those higher forces are acknowledged in every religion. Um, and ultimately by being aware and grateful for the good things in life, um, that's a, you know, that's some practice that was there for thousands of years. It's nothing, you know, why we make it to be a new practice, one of the oldest practices in the world, you acknowledge that spiritual quality of life. And you're grateful for what you have. And you recognize that um, nature is the best teacher. I think that's a very healthy approach to life because it's proactive, you're not a victim, you're being proactive, you're taking responsibility for your life. But at the same time, you're acknowledging that there are higher forces and you're being grateful to those. And you're grateful to people around you. If somebody does something kind to you, I think that's the right approach is to be grateful. If, you know, if your family is helping you, if your community is helpful to you. So it's, it's nothing more than kind of positive psychology. And you don't want to take it too far because then it becomes mood making and it divides your mind. But it's very, it's very good to have that flavor of life and remind yourself that sure, sure. this is something yeah. that can help you. And yeah, things I like, like that. I like practicing you use meditation the word, can help that. Sure. And absolutely. And you use the word nudge, so I like that. It's, just, <laughs> yeah. it's the it's it's the noticing. Yeah. You know. Um, and I heard something you recently. Your attention grows stronger. So if sure. you put your attention on the positive and you're grateful for things, that side of you grows stronger rather than the negative side and the complaining side. You don't really want to feed that. You want to feed the positive. Absolutely. Um, so, DJ Fogg, it's going to be a great day. That's his. Yeah. Um, that works for him. And you talk about the super habit of meditation. Yeah, most of my research was done on transcendental meditation, and it was done at UCLA and Harvard. And subsequent to that, there have been, you know, 
literally hundreds and hundreds of studies on it. Um, and in those days, meditation was not a very common word. People, it was very rare. Um, now, you know, you have mindfulness, you have so many different techniques out there that are very common. Everybody acknowledges meditation. But I think it's important you have to pick a meditation that's easy. And Transcendental Meditation, or TM, is easy. So that, that helps. It's a super habit. And what I've seen in my research is that when you practice Transcendental Meditation, um, and it's because it's easy, you tend to be more regular on it, then you get other benefits. It rewires the brain. You can look at the EEG and see all these changes in the brain. Um, and it rewires the brain so that people, they don't always, but there's a tendency to stop bad habits like smoking, drugs, alcohol, and to adapt better habits. So in my mind, that's a huge, huge plus because anything you can do to improve your daily routine, improve your habits will make a big difference. And right now there's so much stress in the world that practicing transcendental meditation is a huge value. I mean, it, studies have shown how it reduces blood pressure, reduces risk for cardiovascular disease. Almost everybody acknowledges it, but not everybody meditates. They know it and it's out there now so common. When I first studied it, it was rare and odd and strange. Now it's, you know, buzzword everywhere. You look on your iPhone and there's, oh, meditation. There's a category sometimes. But sure, sure. do it's... people do it regularly? No. What do you, what do you think the stumbling... Actually, that's, that's a good segue into um, your biohack one, which is the secret of biohacking, is yeah. actually developing the habit. Right. Because we can talk about all these biohacks like meditation. Everybody knows or they read about the benefits of meditation. Uh, but as you've indicated, many people are not regular with their practice. And it's hard to um, it's hard to realize the benefits uh, unless you, you have that consistent practice. Yeah. So and, and that's going to be the case with all these habits. So how, how do we you know, we've got lots of books on habit change. Well, atomic yeah. habits we've got tiny habits yeah and they're all and good you've been they're, working they're, on they're, it they're good books and you know the interesting thing is ayurveda had a lot of that same knowledge thousands of years ago they're kind of borrowing which is fine and reformulating it in terms of Ayurveda. like ayurveda would say simplest and more, most important thing is start small take small steps now that's the title, you know, Tiny Habits, James Clear's real, you know, he makes in Atomic Habits, the same notion, start small, something doable, something specific, something that's easy, because you have to gain confidence. So our program really takes from Ayurveda, but is very similar to other programs out there. Now you're Keith, you talk about your program. What are you, what are you referring to? I'm referring to the program in the book of habit change. So it's okay. Very, okay. It's, so just I I know there's some other online courses as well. So that's why I asked that question. Yeah, there's a whole new program, superuhabits.com. Um, these ideas I, I've been able to you know co-create some new programs with other people on this, and so um, it's getting out there, but. It is Ayurveda. Now the advantage, okay, why do this habit change program rather than atomic habits or tiny habits? It, the knowledge of Ayurveda has this huge base to it, which is everything has to be personalized. So a Vata person can quickly learn a habit and can quickly move on to something else and not continue the habit. Pitta person's wonderful. Most of these books on habit change are written by Pitta people for Pitta people because they love to make to do lists. They love to adopt new habits, but they can also get, they can overdo it. They can have, you know, 10 habits they're trying at the same time because they're so um, super achievers. And then there's the Kaphas who can't even get started. You know, they're very fixed in their way. They really need help. So our program adds Ayurveda. Now, now you, you refer to in Ayurveda, they refer to the Vata Pitta Kapha. So you're indicating that 
the difference in your program and what you're advocating uh, that people really consider in your book is that Ayurveda is important because you can read a book on habit change, but if they haven't considered uh, the energy state or the personal nature of that individual, what we call the dosha in Ayurveda, um, then it it's doomed for it could be doomed for failure. Yeah, um, it's it, but I, there's I, more likelihood of success, right? If we consider these energy states, these doshas that people right. loosely fall into, we're all we're a combination of all three, right. but our predominant doshas. Um, and you said the vata person. What will help the vata person actually implement positive change? Yeah. It and what and what is a what is a vata person? Describe me. Describe the general well, very, attributes. Yeah, they're very creative. They're very dynamic. They're often in marketing or advertising. Artists, musicians, um, and they're you know full of new ideas. But the problem is that if they get out of balance, then they can go quickly from one idea to the next, and they're very talkative, and they're not. They, they have a hard time focusing. They're not, they need to be grounded. So all the kind of aids for Vata are to ground them. And so for habit change, you know, we have a habit map, we have a habit plan, and we have four levels of feedback, all really good for a Vata. You know, you, the first level is, and this kind of coaching, self-coaching, where you keep a journal, self-reflection, you're keeping track and you, you know, that helps you. Then personal coaching, you get a buddy, could be your partner, could be um, anyone, it could be a, you know, a, a, a professional coach, but that person checks in with you every day, once a week, and so that helps you. And then you get, we also really recommend group coaching, call them learning circles. And there you get together a group of people and you know now, you're each Keith, trying I, to change a habit i know with vata this is great they're creative they're the creators they like movement they like yeah you know changing one idea to another right and they hear about a new habit that's wonderful but they don't like being penned in right they don't necessarily like committing to things right um and they've got the ideas but the follow-through is hard um and yeah they don't like and, a daily they don't like and a they daily get bored. routine, but so what's going to help the daily Vata routine person? is sorry, right. they don't like a daily routine, but the daily routine is actually the best thing for them. Absolutely, because you know a grounded and balanced Vata. Wow, you just you know you got that superpower of creativity going. There's no doubt. It's just you know, flow is amazing. But. How do we how do we keep them with something that we know is, we know is going to be good for them because it's going to ground them but they don't like being necessarily they feel bored they feel constrained yeah no it's these you know the having them make a habit plan where they you know have some intention and then they pick an action they uh create a cue or trigger to remind them to do the habit. They um, have a buddy to check in with, and then they have some reward that they reward themselves. So having them go through this procedure, and then these four levels, the fourth one I didn't get to, it's environment. Um, you know, for a Vata person, having a reminder, maybe a chart on the wall of their daily routine, having, you know, just if they're gonna exercise, just have putting their shoes out by the door. So as they go by it, oh, yes, I'm, you know, my extra, I got to, there are my sneakers, I'm going to go for a walk now. Um, again, it's just really make simplifying it for them. And the the buddy is huge for Vada, the group is huge for Vada. They need all that extra help to do it. They're not a Pitta self driven person. So every little thing we have in this, it's like a toolkit is very, very valuable for Avada. And, you know, we understand that. So we want to make it easy for them. It may and, seem like a break for the Pitta. Yeah, I love the idea of reward or, or you know, something, some kind of reward yeah. for, for Vata. Because, you know, they like fun, they like parties, they like celebrations. Yeah. 
Um, so celebrate. having so celebrating and, and that's is really gonna, important. That's going to give some variety in there too. That oh, yeah. if I if I do this, you know, they're going to say oh, I got to do this. It, it feels like drudgery a little bit. Um, we don't want it to feel like drudgery, so it's got to be fun. I think for Vata, it's got to be fun, and they may need to change it up a little bit, but stay on track. And having reward or celebration, right? And recognition, acknowledgement, and appreciation of what they're doing. Exactly. Um, uh, I think makes a lot of sense. What do you think? Yeah, and I think the kapha person, you know, the vadas and the kaphas are the one that need the most help. The pittas, the self-driven one, it's easier for them to do it. They're only problem. It is, the sneakers much. are already outside. The sneakers are already outside. They they're yeah. com super competitive. They can't wait. They've got the list. They've got their checking are, it they, off. Yeah, it's easy. And the kapha, you know, has sort well, of an opposite problem to the vada. One thing about pitta, though, they sometimes if they don't see results, it, they're done. You're right. Okay, so let's look at something like meditation. Right. Which we both know because we we were meditators that. You know, meditation is something that in order to um, really realize the profound results of meditation in our daily lives, we have to have the habit and we have to practice regularly over time. And it right. does take time. So Pitta, okay, I meditated for a week. Um, where's the results? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Now, the Transcendental Meditation Program, you know, which is the one I think is the easiest to do has a whole program where they put you through, you know, three days of checking. I mean, it's personal instruction. You have a teacher, then it's, you know, three days of going through with other people and then a 10 day check. And then you always have that teacher that you can check in with. So it gives you a kind of a support for that. Now, I remember, you know, giving a course out at UCLA and there was one chemistry professor and he said, well, I don't see any results, but people around me are telling me that I'm nicer. And, you know, so sometimes people don't see their own results. So they, but if they pay attention, they find that other people see the results. So I think it's good for a Pitta to be gold oriented. It's good for them to want to see a result. And that's why a lot of them don't stick with mindfulness or other meditations because they aren't producing something. And TM is very, very clear about, you know, that you will go through periods where you have spectacular results and some periods where you're kind of purifying the body will be less. So there's a really good understanding and Pitt is a very intellectual. So having that understanding helps him. You need a program that is intellectually, it has the knowledge, it has the background that can support it. And then I think Pitt is can be regular. Um, uh, you know, group meditations like Bobby Roth has a, you know, a, an online group meditation. That's great. Just, just that's a, that's a great and, idea. Yeah, that, you know, that's that's a great suggestion right there. Is um, they can join the group meditations and uh, feel more connected, and maybe let go a little bit of their pit. I mean, with pitches, I think. If there's changes that they really know they need to make, make sort of letting go a little bit of their pitta nature, yeah. their drive to succeed, yeah. their um, wanting immediate results, their impatience, right, um, can actually be helpful to really institute the implement the change. Yeah, I think you're right, and so you know for them a guided meditation wouldn't work. They don't want somebody telling them what to do. Um, that's not, you know, maybe a Vada or Kapha would like that, but they're very um, self-oriented. And so having a complete program with knowledge and experience and a group and a TM teacher is really good. Keith, for them. If, excuse me for a moment, but I just realized my laptop is not plugged in. So I need to plug it in. Okay. But keep talking about that. Yeah, and I think when you move the next one that's kind of big 
is the kapha. And that almost no one pays attention to kaphas. And kaphas are the ones that are hardest to get to comply with habits. They're very fixed in their daily routine. So you need, they need help. They really, really need a buddy. They really need a group. They really need someone in the environment to support them. So when you know that about a kapha person, then you can structure a situation for them that's good. Now, once they get started in meditation, they're pretty steady and they're pretty good about regularity. But in other areas of their life, you know, where they're not sitting down and being quiet, they need a lot of help. They don't tend to get up there. They can be couch potatoes. So they really have to get up. They really have to be doing more exercise. So they need for those habits, they need a lot more help. Um, and you know, again, joining a group that does exercise together, having a buddy that you can take walks with, all those things are super important for a kapha. Yeah, no, that's great. I think really that's um, just really knowing, um, tuning in to, you know, who the person is and, you know, what their innate nature, nature is, what you call um, energy state. Right. Uh, in Ayurveda, we, we, we call it dosha, essentially the same thing. Um, and it, it's going to make a tremendous difference in, in really getting these things to stick. Because we can read about these things, we, we can know they're good, uh, but we don't do anything about it. Yeah, well, we start and we stop, start and stop. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I think the, the, the co-creators who are working on this, uh, super you habit um, change program they they've got some other things they've added to it which I think are very very valuable and it's you know the uh, one of the prime movers on this is Dr. Tony Nader and he's very focused on consciousness and once you understand the different levels of your inner self and you realize that um, as you go deeper into consciousness, then you have a much greater chance to change the surface values of life. Um, and Miriam Lodge and Heather Evans, they're also fabulous coaches. So this whole thing has been put into a very packaged program, um, I think, which is enormously uh, effective. And, and if you take out any one component of it, it just doesn't work as well. Yeah, and and what's the, just repeat the title of the program again in, uh, in habits. Superuhabits dot com. And it's a um, a weekly program for a certain amount of weeks. Is that essentially yeah. how yeah, they ten, deliver it? Ten programs. And my son, who's a professional coach, Ted Wallace, he mm -hmm. uses it in business, and okay. uh, he's what they call an agile coach. So he's put a lot of sure. uh, good additions in there, but. Essentially, it's a 10 week program and, um, you know, you go through all the different stages of it and they're elaborated uh, much more than in the book. So it's, it's just a much richer program. The book gives out the, the basics of it, but um, this is much richer. Great. A lot has been added no. to it. No, that's cool. That's great. Superuhabits.com. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, I know we have, we just touched on the surface of the biohacks, um, super habits. Um, but I think it was important really to bring in really the crux, the, the, the difference in implementing habit change that your book advocates versus other habit books. Yeah. And that is the personalized approach, knowing the person who's in front of you, who you're coaching, who you're working with. Uh, is really important. And that's where Ayurveda, uh, as well as many of these habits are Ayurvedic um, and take their roots in Ayurveda. But I, I think that's really a key component. Yeah, and we could do a whole other podcast on the supplements. That's like a giant sure. world of confusion. What sure. supplements could in you know make you live longer? And I well, just... I, I am baffled. I don't know how people can manage because, you know, a new 
ad pops up every second promising enormous benefits and none of them have been studied very well scientifically so it's a it's a it's a, a maze that people have to walk through yeah no absolutely i know we have we've got about uh, 10 more minutes so i would like to touch a uh, highlight a couple of the other um biohacks that sure. you mentioned that i think are important you talk about biohack number seven which is the gut microbiome um Hippocrates, all disease begins in the gut. Can we talk about the importance of this and how Ayurveda factors into this? Sure. Because I know I you have a separate you have separate books on this, but we, we could just yeah, touch it's, it's like it's also in this book. So it it's like a hidden organ that nobody knew about because they didn't have the proper techniques to study it. Once they had gene sequencing. Um, you know, bacteria are aerobic, they grow, these bacteria anyway, they grow in an environment without oxygen. So it's very hard to study them. But when you can, when gene sequencing came along, we suddenly it revealed this huge population. Now it's interesting. In Ayurveda, they place each of the doshas in certain areas of the body as their main seat. So kapha is usually in the chest. And that makes sense because when people get an imbalance in kapha, they get this congestion. And so that's often in the chest. Pitta is usually located in the stomach digestive system. Again, that makes sense because pitta is fire. And so, um, you know, that's where digestion is taking place. Vata is in the colon. And vata is supposed to control the nervous system. It's supposed to control all transportation in the body. It's huge for the body. In fact, Almost all, 80% of disease are started by a vata imbalance. So how do you put that in the colon of all places? I so, know, I, I, when I started studying Ayurveda, I had no idea why vata was in the colon. I know. It's like, I, you know, and, and, you know, the connection between the, the brain, essentially the nervous system and the colon. Right. Um, and, the, you know, so it, it was just mind boggling. Say it is mind-boggling, but when you, so but when it, I first it learned makes about it, perfect the, sense. Yeah. Once you start really thinking about it and, and, you know, even experimenting with your own body in terms of what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. So the microbiome answers so many questions, both ancient and modern, and almost every disease that's known has been connected to the microbiome. So it has an, it produces thousands of chemicals that get into the bloodstream influence the brain, every organ in the body, immune system. So it's a huge regulator in the body. And we, you know, not realizing this, you know, doctors over prescribed antibiotics when we were kids, anything you had, they gave antibiotics. And we now know that's like setting off a nuclear bomb in the gut, it just destroys lots of friendly bacteria, and it's hard to get them back. So we're in a recognition now even something like cesarean birth um, you don't get the same the the initial formation of the gut isn't the same and i mean the gut bacteria and um those bacteria in the birth canal that usually seeds the 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 microbiome of a new baby so they have more allergies they have all kinds of problems so this is huge for the world and there's many, many clinical studies on probiotics and diets. The, but what's interesting is the number one thing that changes the microbiome and probably the most important thing is diet. Whatever you eat will change it. You eat meat, you'll get a different microbiome. Yep. You eat vegetables, you'll get a different microbiome. Those sure. bacteria feed on what you give it. You give tons of you know, high fructose corn syrup. Most of that Fructose doesn't even get absorbed into the gut because we don't have enough receptors in the gut. Most of it goes right down to the microbiome. So you are culturing a whole different ecology in your microbiome um, and you're feeding it something different. We know that, uh, you know, gluten, lactose, um, you know, milk, sugar, all these things impact the microbiome enormously. Yeah. I actually want to read this section of your book, or at least my summary of it, from your chapter on on the on the microbiome. 
Sure. Um, because I think this brings in the Ayurvedic perspective. And that is, uh, in the stomach, we have the Agni, which is our digestive fire. And we have the Ama, the poorly digested food, which causes toxins to go into the to, into the bloodstream and is, is a source of all disease or most disease. Um, you say it's the same in the colon microbiome because the microbiome is in our colon and that is imbalanced dysbiosis, then digestion will not be complete. And by the products of improper digestion and fermentation, they enter the bloodstream and cause problems. So I really want just for our listeners to know what the parallels are between the microbiome, what's called the microbiome today in, in modern medicine and how Ayurveda viewed it. It's hard to find it in Ayurveda, actually. I mean, you know, when you actually microorganisms, there's a name for them, but it's the microbiome is not described specifically like that. What is described is that food is medicine, which really nobody understood. It wasn't even taught in medical school, the importance of food. So the microbiome validates this incredibly important principle of Ayurveda that food is medicine. The food changes the okay. microbiome, the microbiome changes the body. So it yes. is okay. now a very clear support of why diet is so important in Ayurveda. And yes. the intricacies are complicated because there's a world of probiotics, a you know, billion dollar industry. Nobody knows what any of those things do. It's like, you know, uh, one author described it sending Girl Scouts into World War II. I mean, you know, there's so many microbiome that in, introducing a few probiotics, I don't care how special they are or what, may or may not help some people. Some people, probiotics, they get it from natural things, you know, like whether it's um, lossy or, you know, which is a form of yogurt, whether it's from fermented foods. But some people can take the cheapest probiotic and have a big impact on their health. Some people can take the most expensive time release, you know, because some of the uh, bacteria will get destroyed in the stomach acid. So they're coated, all this perfect stuff, and they'll get no effects. So it's still yeah. very uncharted territory. That's why I go back to Ayurveda, because Ayurveda implicitly understood the gut microbiome and gave a number of huge recommendations, which as far as I can see, all support a healthy gut microbiome sure. um, without well, I think just, explicitly you know, talking about it. Sure. Well, I, I think just in Ayurveda, they say, Ayurveda says that 80% of all, all disease um, is a vata disorder and yeah. vata is in the, vata is in the colon. Yeah which is the location of the microbiome. Yes. So Ayurveda, how many thousands of years ago had already identified that this was an area that required special attention. Absolutely. And had a, had a, a real significance for our health. And, and Ayurveda has, you know, simple things like diet. It's got many herbal supplements. It's, you know, recommends meditation. It recommends exercise different for every person. And it has very powerful detox programs called Panchakarma, which are very uh, amazing ways of changing the microbiome. They are much more direct and much more um, powerful in making those changes. So it has a, a lot of different strategies for changing the microbiome. I mean, literally everything we do changes the microbiome. Sure, absolutely. I know we're we're getting toward the end. Can you go for about five more minutes? Oh, I'm fine. No problem. Great. I want to talk about bliss. Ah, good. It's a nice thing to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Um, you in your book you say that Ayurveda, and and this is one of your um, uh, is this under happiness? I believe it is. Yeah. Um, you talk about the biochemistry. One of your biohacks is happiness. So first of all, Ayurveda has what they call Rasayanas, and specifically behavioral Rasayanas. Yeah. Um, 
Could you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, again, it's common sense. I think everybody, in, you know, when you look at these communities, blue zones where people live longer, there are lots of, you know, you can say it's food, it's exercise, but it's also behavioral activities they do. There's a community, there's respect for the elders, they have certain practices they do. So we, modern science acknowledges that behavioral practices are important. Um, and Ayurveda just understood this thousands of years ago and had, again, just common sense, you know, giving respect to elders, giving, um, you know, working together in a community, um, working, you know, on relationships with a partner. There's so many amazing positive things that uh, we, you know, people took for granted for thousands of years and they're not there anymore. We're just not doing them. We're just completely dysfunctional when it comes to um, basics. And so being reminded of these by Ayurveda is very valuable. Sure. And how do you define Rasayana? What's a Rasayana? Rasayana, you know, is defined as something to extend, to improve health and extend life. And so okay. there are herbal Rasayanas that are, again, designed to improve health, but mostly just to extend life. Um, and, you know, some of these have been studied extensively. Um, and what do they do? I would guess they're they're like an epigenetic tool. They switch genes on and off, like the sirtuin genes are really important for longevity. So I think these Rasayanas are ancient formulations that understood how to turn on these genes for longevity and turn off the genes for you know poor health. Uh, but they really only work once you're in a healthy state. Ayurveda would say, first get into a healthy state, then take the Rasayana. And then the behavioral Rasayanas are kind of the mental. So there's the physical side and there's the mental side and both are important. Yeah, and, it, and it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. So Rasayanas, happiness, bliss. You talk about the biochemistry of bliss. You say in your book that Ayurveda speaks of a substance called ojas, which is described as the finest product of digestion and a perfectly healthy digestive system what's the significance you know i'm a i, I live in the u.s ojas why do i care well pretty much everything in terms of mental health and physical health now is described biochemically what's interesting is that ayurveda did this thousands of years ago now we don't know what ojas is but we do know that there are certain you know, like neurotransmitter, like serotonin, when it gets out of balance, people get depressed. So there's a lot of drugs to try to keep it in balance. We know that there are things produced by the microbiome, chemicals that have an impact on your immune system, that have an impact on, on the brain. So everything comes down to chemistry. The fact that Ayurveda understood that there was this chemical called ojas and that it can improve um, you know your physical well-being and your longevity is significant and all it's not one thing that does it it's many different things that do it that that and but it's inf interesting the two things that are emphasized most are stress in the digestive system dysbiosis which we call and stress in the nervous system if you can take away the stress in the nervous system through something like transcendental meditation, you can take away stress in the gut by giving it time to repair itself, having a better diet, you know, so many different things there, exercise, so forth. Then suddenly the body operates more at a more optimal level and it produces this biochemical, which it's like oiling a rusty, you know, machine. Suddenly the machine operates better. And that's kind of what we need is to do that. And um, we still don't know what it is. It, you know, in my mind, it's the Nobel Prize to discover that. But um, everything else in our body is described in terms of biochemicals. So it's, it's it, you know, the, the gut bacteria produce thousands of chemicals. We just don't know which one of them is 
the, is OJAS. So that's a kind of a hunt for science to figure out what is OJAS, how it works. Does it, you know, it strength, supposedly strengthens the immune system, the nervous system. And these are, you know, reduce inflammation. These are key to longevity. So I think OJAS is something we all want to find out what it is. And, but science is all in that direction. You know, it's all as a description of the biochemistry of the healthy physiology or an unhealthy physiology. If your blood glucose levels are too high, it damages everything in the body. So you have to have the right chemicals at the right level. Otherwise, the body, it's very specific, the body, how it operates. And um, Ayurveda knew this, which is really cool. Yeah. And then we can relate yeah. it to modern ideas. It's even more fun. And and whoever finds Ojas, I'm, I can't wait. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. And I know that uh, when you and I spoke earlier, you have a new project that you're working on. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Your diabetes well, project? I'm really interested in diabetes because diabetes, again, it's one of those diseases that's about to take over the world. And, you know, there's a certain percentage of it now, but it's it's going up dramatically. And in indigenous people, black Americans, certain Hispanic, its effect for some reason is even worse. And it gets passed on from one generation to the next, like the 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 cells that you know the egg cells sperm cell can carry genes that then can affect the next generation so these young kids are coming out with very serious diabetes and you know we know it's a big problem but it's at the basis of almost everything cardiovascular disease is huge for cardiovascular disease alzheimer's huge for that all all types of other diseases that are out there, it's a big factor. And it's just a dysfunction of our ability to regulate glucose. It's primarily, in my mind, you know, there's hereditary factors, but this one guy, Alicio Fasano at Harvard says, he thinks that diabetes one is caused by this leaky gut syndrome. Almost everybody would acknowledge that diabetes two is caused by bad dietary habits, lack of exercise, and stress. So these are all things, you know, for diabetes too, all things we can control, but people just rely on drugs, which lower the blood sugar, but they don't get the underlying symptoms. And I think this is where Ayurveda can make a huge contribution. And so I'm very interested in kind of exploring the Ayurvedic understanding of diabetes and how we can um, introduce, I think modern science is amazing. Continuous glucose monitoring is fabulous. You can know what's going on. You can actually figure out what your glucose, you know, you take a walk, glucose goes down, meditate affects glucose. This food affects it this way. So that combination, that integrated approach where you take the best tools of modern science and you combine them with the ancient knowledge of Ayurveda, I think you have a chance of really eliminating this really epidemic that's about to take over and cause havoc in the world. And did you say you're in process of, of working on a book regarding? Yeah, I mean, I always like to, a book for me is just a way of learning. So if I write a book, mm -hmm. I learn more. So that's my yeah. learning tool. Awesome, that's great, that's great. Well, Dr. Wallace, this was, um, a, a wonderful opportunity to flesh out your books. Do you want to just, do you have a copy of your book there? Unfortunately, I don't, I have it on Kindle. Oh, you mean this one? Oh, yes, yes. So um, actually I'm losing it a little bit on the screen. Uh, that's great there. 16 Super Biohacks for Longevity, Dr. Robert Keith Wallace, Shortcuts to a Healthier, Happier, Longer Life. So and if you go on my, you know, name, Robert Keith Wallace and Amazon, you can see all the other books that are there, too. Absolutely. So, well, thank you so much for the, for your time. Really and, appreciate it. And there's a brand new book that just is coming out literally, you know, in the last few days at the MIU Press, which is called yeah. Living in Balance um, with, you know, Marshi Ayurveda. So it's a it's a it's really a good explanation of 
Ayurveda, all the basics of Ayurveda and why Maharishi Ayurveda is unique. So that's another fun one that just came out. Now, is that only going to be available on MIU Press? Will it also well, be on hopefully Amazon they'll get well? it on Amazon soon. Okay, but it's not it's not currently for sale, but will be in in yeah. a couple of weeks. Or yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's that's a great one because um, there aren't enough books on the approach of Maharishi Ayurveda, so that's it's wonderful to have that out there. And and we also did another book on neurohacking for online learning. I like to biohack and I like to neurohack, but we can save that for another time. That's a very fun one. That's a cool one. So if you don't mind hanging out for a few moments, we can, we, I'd like to chat sure. with you. Right. Sure.